Good morning, you all. It's good to see you all this morning. Good to be back with you uh, this morning. Uh, I was really captured as good a, this gospel lesson is, uh, would be, uh, uh, it's hard not to preach on this gospel text. Uh, and yet I was captured by uh, Paul's letter to the Colossians this week, or at least these verses from Paul's letter to the Colossians, really captured by it. Uh, and I think you'll hear in it, uh, I want to look again with you at those first, focus on those first couple or few verses. Uh, and you'll pick up on, I think, the baptismal language there. This idea of, uh, of dying with Christ uh, and being raised with him. Uh, at least that's what I was thinking about as I read Paul's words to the church there in Colossae. He writes, if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. If you have experienced this transformation in life, if you have been born again, so to speak, if you have found this new beginning in your life and faith, then you are a person who is less about seeking after the things of the world and more about things from above. You're less like that fellow in the gospel this morning who can't build his barns big enough. And he's so concerned about filling up his barns, that he's lost sight of a lot of other things in life, I think. And maybe the most important things, the most essential things, the most eternal things. Paul writes this morning, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, he says. You've died to those old things. That old life has been stripped away. And you are a new creature in Christ. He says, for you have died and your life. This is the part I really loved. You have so been transformed that your life has been hidden in God. You're almost unrecognizable to the world. Unrecognizable to the people around you. Such, such is the change in one's, in one's life. And so... Uh, this week, I was looking for a little help with this text, uh, and I was trying to find uh, a commentary, some, some thoughts from someone else that might help me a bit. Uh, I don't know if they help me a whole lot. They may help you some. I, um, uh, I found them somewhat helpful. You may not find them helpful at all. Uh, these are words from St. Ambrose, going back to the 4th century. By the way, this is a commentary I have in my office. Never use it, hardly. Um, it's called an ancient Christian commentary, and I rarely pull it off the shelf, and for whatever reason, I did this week. And this is what Ambrose writes, Bishop Ambrose writes, in the 300s, in the 4th century. Can you imagine? This is what he says about these words from Paul's letter to the Colossians. And he, uh, he, his title on, this, on these words, his, the title he gives to this section is, Flight from the World. Flight from the world, as you seek after, as you seek more the things from above. And he says, to know your goal, for this is the meaning of flight from the world, he says, to know your goal, to unburden oneself of the world. What a gift that is. Think about just the word is a beautiful word, isn't it? To be unburdened. Wouldn't that be nice? I mean, that's really the gift of the faith experience. That's the gift of the spiritual life is to be unburdened by the things of the world. And Ambrose says, to know your goal, to unburden oneself of the world, to unburden oneself of the body, this is the meaning of flight from here. And then he says, to die to the elements of this world is to hide one's life in God. Isn't that beautiful? To die to the elements of this life and this world the, everything that the, that the world, the culture around us is telling us is, is so important, is to be most valued. To die to many of these things is to rise to a new place of being. And it's almost like you're hidden in God. You're hidden in the life and the love and the grace and the wonder of God. This past uh, few weeks, Carol and I have been out and about, catching our breath a little bit, and... Um, Whenever I'm in a different place, I love to grab a local paper. Love to grab a local newspaper. 
Uh, and of course, as I'm reading the stories, they don't mean a whole lot to me because I'm not, I don't live in that context. And so, but I enjoy reading the stories. I love reading the articles. Um, but what I was captured by in one paper uh, on this particular time away was an obituary. It was an obituary uh, on this, this, uh, uh, this woman who had lived uh, a long life and, uh, and her family was, was telling her story. And, it, and, and I, I didn't know I was preaching on this text, by the way, uh, when I was reading these words. But uh, this is what her family wrote. Her family wrote that she actually died years ago. Her family said that she actually died years ago in many ways. She died with Christ, they said, and she was raised to the new life. And they were talking about how she lived, how she lived out of that place. They were talking about how it changed the way she, it changed her countenance, her disposition, the way she engaged the world, the way she encountered the people around her. They talked about the fact that it was as though she was, um, she was unrecognizable in the ways that we knew her before. Almost unrecognizable. And I was thinking to myself, as I read this text this week, she was hidden. She became so in one with Christ in many ways in her life. She was so intentional about that, that it was as though she was, she was hidden in the things of God, in the life and love of God. She was so transformed by that encounter, by that experience with God, that it changed the way she engaged the world and the people around her. And they, they said all they could remember about her life since the day she died for the world was the way she loved and served. That's all they could remember. She just loved and served. And you see, what's really fascinating about this is they also talked about the fulfillment she found. And that's the extraordinary part of the story. You would think that the more that you give up this this notion of self-absorption and self-promotion and this, this living out of this place that is so self-serving and, and moving out toward caring more for the others around you, you would think that that would, would somehow compromise yourself. She discovered that when she came back to herself, she was more enriched and fulfilled in her caring for the other. Wow, as I read this obituary, as I was put back in touch with this, that obituary this week, I thought, what a beautiful, what a beautiful explanation of the life and faith and what, what it can mean for us as people of faith. So I came across this article. Uh, there's, there was an article in Christian Century. I enjoy reading Christian Century. It's a, it's a magazine. It comes out once every couple of weeks. I've been reading it for years. Uh, sometimes I find things in it, sometimes I don't. Uh, but there was this wonderful article uh, in it that was about this man, this author's faith uh, experience. And his name is Dennis Covington. And as I read the, the, uh, the title on the top of the page, I thought to myself, Dennis Covington, that sounds so familiar to me. Uh, and it was really kind of funny because the more I thought about it, I started reading down into the article and I realized, oh my gosh, I have that book. That's why I know his name. By the way, the name of the book is, Dennis Covington wrote a book about 20 years ago. I bought it about a year ago, haven't read it. Um, that's not unusual for me. I'm always behind. Maybe a year or two, something like that. Uh, but I, and I've got, my, well, Carol knows I've got lots of books. And uh, my intention is to catch up one day. But anyway, I was reading this article, and I realized the reason I knew his name was because I bought this book. He wrote it 20 years ago. I bought it a year ago. When he wrote it 20 years ago, it was up for the National Book Award. And let me tell you why uh, this is really kind of fun. It's because then the name of the book is Salvation on Sand Mountain. How many of you know? Salvation on Sand Mountain. See, look at all of you. You've all read it. Let me tell you why you haven't read it. Because you wouldn't necessarily be drawn to it. The subtitle is, the subtitle is Snake Handling and Redemption in Southern Appalachia, National Book Award. And it was an extraordinary article 
to get in touch with this fella whose book I can't wait to read now. I actually started reading some of it this week just because I was so excited after reading the article. Uh, his his story is pretty, uh, pretty extraordinary and significant as it relates to the text, uh, this letter this morning uh, from Paul to the people in Colossae. Because Covington writes about the fact that his life changed in the 1980s. He says that he and his wife were in El Salvador during the Civil War there in El Salvador. Many of you will remember uh, many of those haunting stories that came out of that Civil War. Uh, Covington and his wife were there, and he describes himself, he describes their relationship. He says, our lives were pretty messy. He says, our lives were pretty messy. He said, in fact, we were pretty miserable people. We drank too much. This is what he says in the article. We drank too much. We were pretty miserable people. And then something happened in El Salvador in the 80s when we were there, and we were exposed to the, particularly, he said, as I looked at the trauma in the eyes of the children, I was suddenly awakened in my spirit, and I was raised up to a higher place. He talks about an awakening that he had in that moment. And so the interviewer of Dennis Covington is trying to figure out, okay, so you had this spiritual awakening in El Salvador uh, back in the 80s. How did that lead to, to uh, salvation on Sand Mountain and, and sort of spending time with snake handlers? And, uh, and, he, and she says, by the way, what does salvation mean to you? And he says, oh, salvation from self. Salvation is about, it's about salvation from self, he says. Salvation from self. He says, I've got a pretty big ego. He says, as do a lot of people. And it's terribly destructive. It's terribly destructive. I've had to live with that for a lot of my life. And what I realized that salvation meant for me was salvation from, was being saved from me. Salvation from self. This is what Paul's talking about this morning to the church in Colossae. You have died. You who have died in Christ. Those of you who have allowed the God of life, new life and love to strip away the old self have put on a new life. You've put on a new attitude, a new disposition, a new way of being alive in the world. You are different. You are changed. And Covington says in this interview, he says, every time I touch that book, every time I even think about that book, even in this interview, he says, I'm getting in, the touch, with the fa- I'm getting in touch with the fact that my spiritual awakening, my salvation was all about looking outward more than inward. It was a journey, it has been a journey out of my, a journey out of myself. He said, in fact, even when I wrote this book, he says, I don't really remember coming up with much of it myself. So much of it was God-given. It was as though God took me up by the Spirit and just sort of wrote this book through me. I thought to myself, what an extraordinary experience. What a gift it is, this gift of faith. To be able to be, to experience those moments, maybe even days, of true spiritual freedom. Liberation from the burdens, as as Ambrose would say, from the burdens of this world. What a gift it is to be lifted up out. How many times during the day do you have those moments where it's almost as though you, uh, you leave yourself. You've almost forgotten whatever it was that you were wrestling with or struggling with the moments before. You just are suddenly, you, it's almost like you come back to yourself and you realize that um, it's almost like it's been this wonderful gift where I was out of my mind for a moment. And I was able to engage and encounter the world, perhaps even others, in ways that were ways that were different, in a way that was different. See, that's the gift of transformation. That's why we preach it so hard, maybe not so well every week, but we, that's why we preach it so hard, 
is because the life in faith is, a, is an invitation to, to come out into a whole new way of being and engaging each other and engaging the world. It's so liberating. It's an unburdening experience. The burdens are lifted. What, what we're worried about, what we're so worried about today is suddenly, suddenly we see it from a different perspective, a different angle. We find our balance. We don't let all of those other things in the world uh, make us different, make us into people that we don't want to be. In fact, we're a little more cautious. We're a little more guarded because we know that we have the same power to free the other. But we can't do that when we're so self-absorbed, so self-determined, and so much about manipulating the lives, the lives and the life around us. I think that's the invitation this morning for all of us. As we listen to Paul's words, be willing to die to that old self a little bit more today. Allow God to lift you up out of that place into that hidden place where there's lots of new life and wonder and possibility. Where you're not so much concerned about worldly gains, building a bigger barn, as you are concerned about making an eternal impression. An eternal impression on life and the people and the world around you. When that comes back to you, that's the stuff of self-fulfillment. That's the good stuff. That's the place of enrichment, personal enrichment. Amen.